welcome to another episode of Critical Conversations where we discuss hot topic issues related to the Muslim world. Past discussions have focused on social, religious, and political trends, and in this conversation, we'll add a new dimension to that conversation, namely the environment, in particular, the impact of climate change on the Middle East. Our guest today is Professor Greg White of Smith College. Dr. White is the Mary Huggins Gamble Professor of Government, the current chair of the Government Department, and a member of the Environmental Science and Policy Program Committee. He teaches courses on global environmental politics, international relations, migration and refugee politics, and international political economy. Dr. White's research and publications focus on Moroccan politics, environmental politics, and international security. Professor White, welcome to the program today. Thank you very much. It's a true pleasure to be here. Thank you. To start, if you could just please give an overview of this issue. What are the major implications of climate change in order of, in order of significance on daily life in the Middle East? And what have we seen already, and what are projected impacts? Um, of course, I mean, it goes without saying that's a very complicated question, but it's a, um, it's a good one because the, the change in the past to this moment um, has been profound. I mean, it's been very, very significant throughout the region. Um, I think one of the key things to think about when we look at the Middle East and North Africa and the Mediterranean Basin is that you're looking at a part of the globe that is at 30 degrees north of the equator. And if you go all the way around the globe, that's basically going to take you around to all the major deserts in the world. So the United States in the southwest, that's the uh, you know, Mojave Desert and the, the American Southwest. Um, over to the east, you have the Gobi Desert. Um, and of course, where North Africa and the Middle East is, you have the Sahara going over to the Arabian Desert. So it's a very challenged region, region to begin with um, in terms of where it's positioned in the globe and, and the kind of uh, climatic um, you know, weather patterns it has and, uh, and its, its natural attributes. But again, over the past bunch of decades, uh, 30, 40, 50 years, uh, the, the, the climate change has had a significant impact already on the region. Rising temperature, um, decreased rainfall, um, rising um, sea levels on coastal regions, which leads to salinization of groundwater. Um, so the, the change in the region has been quite profound to this, to this day. Um, and looking forward, looking into the future, projections um, are significantly worrisome, as they are for these other parts of the globe that I already mentioned as well. Um, I might add, in the 30 degrees south is also the deserts of the south. You know, the okay. Atacama Desert in Chile, um, mm. the Kalahari Desert in southern Africa, and the uh, Great Outback in Australia. So this is a really you know, troubled band of the globe, and this is where the Middle East and North Africa is positioned. And all the projections going forward are, um, whether they be from immediate or moderate uh, medium range increases to severe increases of temperature, decreases in rainfall, um, increases in severe weather events, it's, it's very concerning. It's a, it's a very you know, challenged region, to put it mildly. As, as we look about th this band, uh, roughly how many people, just if you size it, if the United States is 330 million people, how, how big a group of people are, are in this zone? Off the top of my head, I don't know. That's a really good question. That's something that, that I should know. Um, you know, um, more, more readily. Um, it's, it's, you know, I would guess in the order of 400 million, 500 million. It's, and it depends what you consider to be part of the region. Um, how far to, into, into Africa, mm -hmm. for example, yeah. you range, you know, whether it's the Sahara and then the Sahel, that's to the south of the Sahara. And then in the Eastern Mediterranean, same thing, you know, what you consider to be part of the region. Um, the, short, the short answer is that it's extremely populous. And what's also significant about the, the population in the region is that demographically it tends to be very young, um, which has to do with a whole complicated range of uh, factors having to do with the kinds of mm -hmm. development that, is, uh, that the region has experienced. Um, so it's, you know, demographically it's challenged in this, with this young population and, 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 and very populous in turn. There's significant strain and stress on economic and social systems because of the large size of the population. So, so bigger than the United States, just using that yeah. as our measuring rod. Yeah, for sure, absolutely. Bigger than the European market, which is 350, 400 million, uh, absolutely. It's, uh, it's, it's, very, it's very populous, indeed. And do you think, just for curiosity's sake, how, what, what is the issue in terms of the climate that ha is impacting the most people in this region right now? 
Mm. I, th I think in, in, in one word, it's water. Mm. You know, it's, it's potable water, it's drinkable water, and, and a, as well as water for um, agricultural use, as well as water for industrial use, because mm. after all, so much water is used in industrial processes as well. So any effort to uh, 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 pursue economic development or economic growth requires significant water inputs into industry, into agriculture, and then of course into people's lives, you know, to, 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 ex to exist. So as temperature increases, that increases rates of uh, evaporation. Mm -hmm. um, as rainfall becomes more episodic and, and, and less, less, uh, less prevalent, that similarly is a, is a, real, is a real issue. Um, so yeah, in a word, water mm -hmm. um, and, and, and the effects that it has in the region. Uh, and I mentioned too that the uh, you know, groundwater is often uh, salinated um, because of encroaching uh, seas and, uh, and, 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 and evaporation again. So there's, um, there's just the ability to find good, fresh water it has bedeviled the region forever, you know, for millennia. Mm -hmm. has, has long been a longstanding problem for this region as with any desertified region. Um, but, it's, but it's especially so, um, uh, you know, in recent decades and moving forward, it's expected to be the case. Um, and that's where I think climate change is so central as an issue. Obviously, I mean, that's our main concern and it's, it's profound. Um, but I think at the same time, we have to take into account policies that don't consider the realities of a kind of water-stressed mm. regions like, region like this. So for example, in so many countries, uh, they have tried to pursue uh, the growth of crops for export, uh, like citrus or tomatoes yeah. or grapes for, for wine. Uh, this is especially the case in North Africa, but it's also the case in even war-torn Yemen. Um, you're trying to grow crops for export to international markets because they're lucrative and they bring back important foreign exchange, but those crops are, um, are, have a high water demand. Um, or if you try to develop your tourism sector, which is a you know, significant part of the Jordanian economy or the Egyptian economy or the Moroccan economy, uh, tourists like to take showers <laughs> and they like swimming pools and they want to go golfing and in Marrakesh outside uh, outside Marrakesh in Morocco uh, they have water parks they've constructed for, <laughs> really? for tourists and it's uh, it's 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 laughable it's preposterous right it's that kind of you know the, how could that how could that be in a, in a, in a region <laughs> of the country that's that way. Um, arid it's not desert in Marrakesh but it's very arid and um, and, and it's it's it's, it's a preposterous development strategy, if you will, and yet that's what they do to try to attract tourists. Tourists. Yeah. Well, you, you had earlier mentioned Yemen, and if we think about Yemen, we think about the Middle East generally, it's a conflict-prone area. Absolutely. Is, is, it, is it clear, um, this is going to be an added stressor on an already stressed region, can you sort of prognosticate, is it clear what's going to happen, or? Um, um. A prediction, right? You know, that's, yeah. Uh, it's hard to know. I, I, you know, if I had a crystal ball, it would be uh, it would be fantastic if we if we were to have one. But um, it's 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 definitely hard to know. But we can expect that it'll be extra challenging. It's certainly very challenging for a region as Yemen. Hopefully, I mean, it's hard. To, you know, the, the, as you would try to be optimistic that, that optimistic that somehow the conflict will come to a close at some point in the future. Who knows when? It doesn't seem to be on the near horizon. But when it does come to a close, um, environmental stress, water, all these kinds of issues certainly hamper post-conflict reconstruction. It's really hard to, yeah. to rebuild a society when you, when you are um, dealing with scarcity of, of, of water and, and challenges for growing um, you know, uh, um, um, food for the population. And so that's, so it's, it can only exacerbate uh, an already difficult situation. When you talk about recovering from these issues or, or forming economies around these issues in ways that are more sustainable and renewable, there, this region in particular, I'm sure there are so many difficulties with that because it's one of the world's biggest producers of oil, too, which is its, its own issue. But um, within this sense, how does the oil economy of the Gulf region and the Gulf states impact this region's response to potential climate-induced conflict, um, and uh, politically and just economically, um, and are are there positive trends that you see in this region? I'll, um, I'll, I'll set aside the positive trends. <laughs> um, um, 
maybe no is the quick answer <laughs> to that. So maybe I'm not sending it aside. I think the answer is no. Um, the, the, the fact that these, so many of the economies in the region are dependent on oil is a real, has been a real um, curse, mm -hmm. if you will. I mean, it's that old um, label, the resource curse. You know, these countries have a, you know, the, the resource paradox, the resource curse. Uh, the founder of OPEC, uh, a Venezuelan by the name of Perez, said that we are drowning in, in uh, La Mierda del Diablo. You know, we're drowning in the devil's yeah. um, poop. And so this is that, it, you know, oil is a real resource curse for so many countries. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very rare to find an instance of a country that has, um, or you know, maybe a state in the case of Alaska, that has taken oil resources and managed them responsibly mm -hmm. and in a just fashion. Um, and the Middle East and, you know, the countries of the Middle East are no, are no exception in that regard. They've had a real challenge with it. Um, it's caused all kinds of distortions in the ways their economies have developed, um, you know, because they rely on the rents, the, the profits that are derived from the extraction of oil and the selling of oil overseas. Um, and then that just affects the rest of the economy. Mm -hmm. Sometimes countries have been known to take some of that oil wealth and turn it into social programs and other ways of developing the economy, but it's, it's really hard to do. Um, I think a, an additional piece of this too is that a lot of the countries in the region when it comes to climate negotiations, uh, whether it be Kyoto, you know, 20 years ago or more, um, well, 20 years ago, um, and then more recently Paris, it's the, the oil producing nations are often very much ally, aligned against um, efforts to mitigate um, greenhouse gas emissions because they see it as a threat to their economic model. Mm -hmm. So there are strong lobbyers and strong parts of coalitions that work to, uh, to, work to, to undermine, if you will, you know, sort mm -hmm. of undercut these kinds of negotiations. Um, so it's the, you know, it's the kind of economic development that has happened. It's the kind of diplomatic politics that happened on the, uh, you know, for climate change negotiations. Um, oil implicates all of us, right? You know, we, we, we need it. We use it in our own economies uh, around the globe. Um, and so in that way, you know, citizens around the globe are implicated in these, uh, in, the, in the need for oil. Um, but that's a long answer to your question, is it? You know, how does it complicate it? It definitely does. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, moving forward, it's hard to see how, I mean, right. and absent moving away from oil um, and reliance on oil for energy production, um, that, that it could be improved. Mm -hmm. And you talk about the impact on like people around the globe in terms of an oil economy, but I've also heard that in the countries where oil is, is the prime, where it's economy based off of oil primarily, that they tend towards dictatorship. There's something about oil um, and the fact that it's such a, a resource that can control the global markets that is um, really, that has impact with the, the people in those countries too. Um, is that something that you've seen or can speak to? Wow, that's a, <laughs> and that's a, that's a, that's a trippy question. I mean, that's a really good question, right? Because, you know, there, there are definitely oil economies that are not autocratic. Right. Scotland. Norway. Norway right. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, there, there, are, there are Alaska. I mean, there, there, it's possible to have an oil economy mm. in a, within a, within a, a government that is doesn't lend toward um, um, autocracy, but then I, so I guess for me though that I wonder if it, that then leads us to a kind of um, chicken egg question. Mm -hmm. It's hard to know whether oil emerges in you know, whether whether oil encourages autocracy, you know, autocratic governments to mm -hmm. emerge, or whether autocratic governments, I don't know, are, are susceptible to developing oil in the way that they do right. so. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I tend to think it's the it's the it's if it's one of those two, it's the one where the Oil, the, the presence of oil wealth distorts the incentives on the part of the government, and it also leads to support for those governments by external actors. Mm -hmm. You know, not least you know European colonial powers, and in turn the United States, um, in the context of the Cold War, and the close support that the United States and Europe have given to autocratic um, countries in the region, um, in in exchange for stability and the extraction of oil. Mm -hmm. um, a good example of that, if I could real quick, is, is Gaddafi in Libya. You know, for, for many, many years, especially um, after 2003, when Gaddafi relinquished uh, WMD, um, the weapons of mass destruction, um, he did pretty well by Europe. You know, he would mm -hmm. argue that he was doing Europe's work. He was providing Italy and Europe more broadly with natural gas and oil. Um, and he was 
interdicting migrants mm -hmm. um, coming across from, uh, you know, that might have wanted to go to, to Europe. And when the NATO began, when the NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization began its bombing of Libya in 2011, in March of 2011, Gaddafi was enraged. You know, mm -hmm. he, was, he felt betrayed that, mm. that Europe and the United States, that NATO was doing this. After all I have done for you, mm. you're bombing me now? So it's that sort of you know, mm. um, bargain that, that is often made with autocratic leaders. And, um, you know, and, and he, was, he felt like he'd kept up his, his side of the bargain. You, know, you, you talk about, um, this is almost a paranoid question. <laughs> the, the, us talking about this, um, do you think that as people come to realize that this region, maybe perhaps differentially from the rest of the world, will be more severely impacted by, by climate change, could we be contributing, to, even, even around this table right now, to sort of people taking actions like having tighter borders against people from that, from that region, sort of in anticipation of people f fleeing that? Uh, or could it encourage more conflict like we talked about? Or is, t you know, so there's the other school of thought that would say, yeah, understanding the problem is the first step towards solving the problem. Um, do you have any yeah. line of sight on that? No, and I think, <laughs> and I, I think I'd be in the, latter, in the latter part of that question because it's, it's sort of understanding the problem would begin to provide uh, you know, suggestions of the kind of policies that should be pursued. Because you're absolutely right. You know, a, a one, one mode of thought might be to say, well, this is a con conflict-prone region historically, and um, it's been thus to the present time. And moving forward, it looks like it's going to continue to be in many, many different parts of the, uh, of the, of the region. So the solution should be a security-minded one. Let's, right. let's build borders. Let's you know, pick winners and, 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 and allies in, in terms of the factions that are fighting mm -hmm. um, and try to you know, contain the violence and try to you know, con you know, contain the, 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 the brewing um, trouble in, in the region. Um, and that's certainly a, a common sort of mode of thinking um, among policymakers. There's no doubt about it. It's, 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 it's an easy one in some ways to, to move toward because it's, it, 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 it not plays on fears, but just sort of, it, okay. it sort of it, um, follows the logic, you know, that, that this is the nature of the situation and that that's what you must do most immediately. There is an immediate logic, isn't, isn't there? I think if you take Angela Merkel as an example, sort of took the compassionist route, but as, at a certain point, the immediate logic of lots of people coming in is, is very hard politically to, to argue against, right. I think. Yeah, and that's, you know, and, and that's the, the refugee crisis in 2014, 2015, 2016, and you know, even the last two years, of course, but especially a few years ago in which she did that. Yeah, that was a, had profound implications for European politics and for German politics more directly, um, absolutely. Of course, at the same time, most of the refugees and people who were displaced in the region stayed within the region. You know, the vast, the vast bulk did not move mm -hmm. out of the region, um, you know, in this case, toward, toward Europe. But I think that, you know, to back to your, your question, it was a really good one because it's the idea that there has to be ways, that, you know, creative solutions have to be found to begin to the process of backing out of the situation okay. as it is right now. Um, so that's why we, we, the we sitting around this table, yep. you know, sort of thing, um, we have to move toward mitigation. We have to, you know, reduce the amount of greenhouse gases that are going into the, uh, into the atmosphere. We have to move toward, um, you know, renewables. Um, and removing the incentives for the production of this kind of oil mm -hmm. uh, that affects the economic development and, and, uh, and affects the, the climate. So there has to be mitigation efforts and there has to be adaptation efforts. So rather than building borders and hardening security, yeah. um, work with governments in the region on their adaptation to already existing climate change. Um, encourage them not to build these kinds of water parks, water to, be, park. to be you know, flip about it. Um, encourage them to, you know, figure out ways to make their populations resilient to, to increasing temperatures and, 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 and less, less, uh, less rainfall. If I'm not mistaken, there actually is a thousand foot ski slope in Saudi Arabia. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, in, just, in the, just to... In the just Gulf, yeah, it's an indoor. It's, it's, an an, it's indoors, it's yeah. It's an indoor slope. Same idea. You know, Same idea. Obviously, yeah. profoundly energy intensive to power that. Now, they have the oil. To mm -hmm. do so. They mm -hmm. can certainly do um, it. But, there's, you know, but then there are some bright um, spots in the horizon. For example, you know, the use of solar power is becoming more and more common. In, mm -hmm. in Morocco, there are 
there are in North Africa and in the Gulf as well, there are solar arrays that are significant and that technology is improving and that can be um, expanded on, I, 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 would, I would hope, I would argue and would push for. Yeah, knock on wood. Yeah. To continue, yeah, to continue this talk about the, the opportunities, if you will, within this kind of um, issue, what do you think, is there, is there any risk in or, or opportunities in using climate change um, conflict data and um, research um, to reframe, uh, reframe internal conflicts as shared external problems, um, which involve factions can work together to solve? Um, because oftentimes when there's a larger issue that two um, groups have to combat, it's that that can maybe work work out internally to uh, both of their benefit in some way. Yeah, and this is the uh, this is the challenge in the in the scholarship and the scholarly literature on this. The uh, this is one of the situations where we end up saying on the one hand, on the other hand, mm -hmm. um, it's really <laughs> unclear. Um, and believe me, I mean it won't surprise you know you both to to know that the. Uh, the scholars have spent a lot of ink on this and you know, um, you know, um, published a bunch on these kinds of issues and made a lot of studies. Um, what we have is we have a lot of data about mm -hmm. um, scarcity and environmental change. And we also have a lot of data about conflict. And when you take those two data sets and you put them together to see if there's a correlation between increasing scarcity and increasing conflict, the findings are really divergent. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are some studies that say yeah, increasing environmental scarcity leads to more conflict. And then there are others that say to the contrary. And the, the logic for the, to, for the second group is that just because there's scarcity, that actually diminishes conflict. Because mm. in order for people to fight, in order for people to have conflict, they have to have resources. They have mm -hmm. to have strength. They have to be, you know, um, they, have to, they have to have the ability to do that. And in the context of scarcity, those, those, that, that ability is, is, is diminished. So we have these kind of conflicting arguments. And then what people do, again, this won't surprise you, is they do meta-studies. They do studies of studies. Mm -hmm. And this is you know, not unlike you know, epidemiological literature on, um, you know, on health care matters, you know, trying to you know, figure out what's, what's to be found. And in that instance, same thing. There are some meta-studies wow. that show that it's, that it's connection, and mm -hmm. then there are some that show that there's no connection. And so for me, what that leads me to think is that what we have to do is we have to keep climate change as kind of a, an environmental change as a background sort of context, mm -hmm. as this sort of situation. It's real, it's happening, and it has to be addressed. But in terms of the conflict, the direct conflict itself, other approaches have to be mm -hmm. you know, pushed. You have to push for diplomacy. You have to push for economic development. You have to encourage um, uh, all, all kinds of ways of trying to diminish conflict Rather than saying the environment's getting worse and it's bad and it's going to cause more conflict, so well we might as well just prepare for the conflict. We might as well, yeah. So that's the that's the logic that I think is very circular and leads us down to sort of a kind of thinking that doesn't take us out of the you know fruitful you know attempts to try to find fruitful mm -hmm. solutions. Yeah, almost our Armageddon becomes a self fulfilling Armageddon. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the only thing worse than you know, uh, you know, think the worst way of thinking about tomorrow is thinking about tomorrow as being you know just sort of bad. Bad. <laughs> yeah, and that kind of apocalyptic thinking or catastrophist thinking leads to or uh, you know leads to a kind of policy stance that is back to the security piece. You know, mm -hmm. it's all about security and conflict, and I think that's the worrisome part for me. Go, go. But I isn't yeah, there an opportunity yeah, yeah. also to yeah. think about, you talked about economic development as a way to kind of secure the region a little bit more. Isn't there hope in the fact that like eventually we will all need to transition our economies and, and you know, innovate to address this issue? And so if this region is kind of having to do that maybe a little faster than other parts of the world, isn't there a That's little, right. isn't, aren't there opportunities in that? Can't they kind of become the leaders in this or, you know, they're beheld to oil, or there, but is is there some opportunity with this um, in terms of economic development and this issue? And I, yeah, it's a good question. It's a really good question because I think that there the, there are people on the ground in the region. Again, I'm more familiar with North Africa. Mm -hmm. There are people on the ground who get it. I mean, they they understand that you know it's getting warmer. They understand that it's harder to grow crops. That it's harder to get clean water. Um, in Morocco, there are you know, rural women in the Middle Atlas who are uh, working to obtain clean water mm -hmm. and they, they, they protest, they, they clamor for it, 
and, and they, they, they create all kinds of inventive ways of retaining water and storing water. So they are working on it. They're, they're working to adapt to it. Um, I think those of us sitting around the table need to support that. And we need to support governments that in turn will support mm -hmm. that and rather than governments that will pursue economic policies that are you know, more beneficial to affluent groups and, uh, and, 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 and um, kind of a, 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 a bad development, a mm -hmm. maldevelopment, mm -hmm. a, a, a poorly, de you know, uh, poorly designed development. Mm -hmm. You know, as we as we sort of come to the close of what's this kind of fascinating discussion, it it's good to think that there's something that we can do. That we we three and those people that actually watch our conversation uh, and do you, do you think is there hope? I guess that's my that's my bottom line question. I I think so, and I mean I would turn to to <laughs> to, to, to leave too. I mean it's um I, I I'd like to think there's hope. You have to if. If that's why my concern is, if people move in that apocalyptic, or it's just going to get worse and worse and right. worse, then the solution is survivalism. But if you say no, there's there's got to be ways of getting out of this. You know, people are not going to disappear yeah. in the next 10, 20, 40, 60, 80 years. Well, let's make it better. Mm -hmm. I think that's the kind of mode that we have to, to move in. And again, I would turn to you as a uh, <laughs> as a uh, as a as a young person. You know, what, what's your take? I I am hopeful, but I think I'm also naive. And that's why we <laughs> and that's why we have you because because when when it, this issue is studied and I think that's also comes back to what you're saying is that when there's more information about an issue, the future generations even if a current generation can't solve it or but a future generation will have more tools to do so with historical analysis or just looking at trends and and so I think that I think that hope can bring about change but also I think that the data needs to be there too so yeah, I and I think that. Cool. Yeah. Both both generations and and all facets of society can provide that if we if we focus on it. Yeah, well said. Yeah. Yeah, I I think if we can just recognize what the problem is, right. which we're struggling with here and uh, evidently uh, I was sorry to hear there, um, I, I think there there's there's hope. Um, but I for one no longer talk about climate change affecting my grandkids. It, it's affecting mm -hmm. it's affecting grandpa, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and that's. Uh, as it, as it should be, yeah. in, in a way. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you very much oh, for, my true for, pleasure. for being here today. And, and actually, Leif, I want to thank you for actually making this connection. Uh, it's, it's not every high school student that uh, has, has the thought to bring together these resources on this, on this product, project. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you very much.